Welcome to Expedient Meetings with Lin Ai Wei on Tom Monk Radio. Lin currently resides in China and is a founder and head teacher. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm not going to do that again. I don't believe you, but I'll, I'll, I'll trust that you won't. I'll be very disappointed if you do. It'll let me down and heartbreak me. Welcome to Expedient Means at Lin Wei and Time Monk Radio. Lin currently resides in China and is a founder and head teacher of Guizhen Philo Cultural Society. His extensive experience in Buddhist and Taoist meditation, Qigong, martial arts, and traditional Chinese medicine. To learn more about Lin, please visit his website at www.guizhenhui.net. Tonight, Lin will be discussing the Six Harmonies. And welcome back, Lin. Hello. Yeah, so you want to talk tonight about the six harmonies. Uh, the six harmonies. And that, that's in reference to Buddhist cultivation? Yes. Now, in, in Buddhist cultivation, there's this practice called the six harmonies. Usually, it's for a sangha, which is a group of three or more cultivators living together. Um, but what we're going to do today is explain what they are, and then we're going to transform them into something we can utilize daily, meaning you don't have to be Buddhist to practice these. So we're going to change the, the application of them from strictly, um, well, originally it wasn't for strictly, but it was just for, just no one else used it for anything else. Uh, strictly, f We're going to take it from being strictly a Buddhist practice, and we're going to see how it can be utilized um, in, in any mannerism of our lives, whether you are any other type of religion or practice you take, uh, if you live, obviously live in society or live in the mountains or wherever you live, um, we can utilize it for our daily interactions, especially with our significant other. So it's going to be a very uh, interesting six, uh, five or six, let me see here, six harmonies. Duh. <laughs> so the, uh, these come out, of the, they come out of the monastic tradition? Pretty much. The Buddha had sent this out to his disciples uh, as a way for uh, them to get along together, basically. Okay. You know? When they're away from the main group, like if the Buddha is not around, uh, maybe he's in some other city or something doing lectures, um, how are the disciples going to handle themselves when you have some who are uh, egotistical, you have some who are aggressive, you have some who just can't control themselves? I mean, don't forget, you know, um, people out there who consider a Buddhist to be a specific way, you're very much in the wrong views. Um, a Buddhist is just a person cultivating. They're investigating their mind. Just because they practice a set of methods uh, labeled Buddhism doesn't mean they're a Buddha already. doesn't mean they're anything special. It doesn't mean they're already accomplished. They're still a person, still out making mistakes. They're still out living their lives, trying to do the best they can uh, according to the methods they're utilizing. Um, okay, so if they were so perfect, they'd be Buddhas themselves, I guess, right? Pretty much. And then you'll have people who turn around and say, well, aren't we already Buddhas? Well, there's two types of Buddhas. There's a false Buddha and the true Buddha. The false Buddha is basically the people who have not awakened their wisdom. And the true Buddha is one who has awakened to their wisdom. That means it's not just, ooh, I have epiphanies. It's not just, ooh, I understand how things are working. No, it's a total purification of their conduct. When I say purification, it's literally meaning it's practicing the cultivating of the proper conduct. Proper conduct means you're not using false speech on people, meaning you're not talking bad about people, you're not gossiping about people, you're not cursing out people, you're not doing insinuations in your speech, even though you're not verbally saying how much uh, either you feel the person's a moron or you yourself are really a great person. Um, it's leaving all types of these small little nuances out of your speech, out of your heart, out of your mind. So th there, there's a whole practice of doing this, and people think, some think, that practicing of virtue and merit and proper conduct and whatnot is not really important to attain wisdom. But obviously, uh, actually, it is very important because you can have great knowledge and great wisdom. Let's say you opened up some of wisdom and then what happens? You still have 1% of, of moronic behavior or 1% of ignorance. That 1% totally poisons the rest of your mind. So even a small cup of water that has a small drop of poison in it is still poisoned water. No matter how small the drop is, it's still going to have a negative effect on the body. Ah, so again, with education and cultivation, it's still going to have a negative effect on the mind. If all we're doing is practicing to uh, attain some types of states or powers and get some wisdom without correcting our own behavior and, and personal attitude. Okay, well, let's yeah. jump in. What's the uh, what's the first harmony? 
Well, the first harmony, unity in cohabitation. So we all know what cohabitation means, living together with thing, uh, people. Well, first step here is, is living together in unity um, with love for each other, like brothers and sisters. Now, this is in a sangha where you have nuns and monks. Okay, You have men and women living together, uh, cultivating the Buddha Dharma. Um, so the men have to control their own personal urges and the women do also. So instead of seeing a person as the next person who is a physical body that uh, one can go and try to seduce, you see them as your brother, you see them as your sister. So who's really going to go and, and do anything with their brother and sister? <laughs> Unless you're into that kind of thing. Um, but for the majority of people out there, not many are. <laughs> so um, you see them as your family member. So you, you, you totally abolish uh, those sexual urges you may have towards them. Some people have issues with sexual sexuality and cultivation. They think it's okay, and that you know, if you're a Taoist, if you're a Taoist or a cultivator, or if you're a Buddhist cultivator, um, you know, sexual urges are important because it helps you stay natural in the right flow and helps nourish your body and, and your energy. If that was the case, Buddha would be having sex left and right. Uh, he wouldn't have become a Buddha. He said he, because he was able to cut that off, he attained. That was one of the hardest things to cut off. So people are still yapping about this sexuality is the best thing and Taoism or Buddhism or energetic cultivation becoming one with the way is to strengthen your uh, sexual urges or even go and indulge in your desires and urges uh, steering you in the wrong direction. These things don't improve you, okay? And indulging in them to a great degree only hurts you. Playing around with them here and there only makes you feel good and it doesn't make you lift up. You get states of bliss, but that doesn't mean anything. Anyone can have a state of bliss. So the unity, in living, uh, the, the unity of cohabitation is whether you're with a person, maybe they're your significant other, uh, maybe they are your friend and you're just roommating with somebody or even just walking around the street. You want to see them as someone you would actually be helping with. You, um, you would actually be helping Okay, you don't want to just forget your connection with people and uh, think you are the best and greatest person in the world. You have to learn how to deal with them and deal with yourself is the most important. What do you think? Sorry, I got this fly that's swarming around me and I was trying to swat him. I'm not very Buddhist. Haha, <laughs> it's very funny. Are you still there, Lynn? Yeah, I'm here. I just got a weird connection. Um, so the unity and cohabitation is basically saying, how can we utilize this in our daily life, in our every single moment of our life, not being Buddhist? I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a Muslim or uh, I'm a Jew, okay, or I'm a Confucianist. How do I deal with all this stuff? Well, very simple. You just see people as your family. How hard is that unless you're really trying to get something from other people, unless you're climbing on conditions and trying to hurt other people for your own benefit, you know? Um, it's very easy. So unity and cohabitation is simply wherever you are, that's where you live because that's where you are. And you treat people with the same mutual respect, same thing as a, I do to you what I want people to do to me, that kind of idea. Uh, that's sort of the basic premise of Christianity too, right? treat others as you would have them treat yourselves. Sure, but it never really panned out that way <laughs> throughout well, history, right? True. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess we you, can you go could, in, yeah. Well, you could say that's that's probably at the core of most religions, but you know, it's the practicing that most people tend to falter on. You know, sometimes the education is right, sometimes the education sucks. Sometimes the education's good and the people just uh, are hungry. They're greedy. They want something. You know, hungry meaning they're desirous. They want more. So they try to utilize teachings that are good to, for their own benefit. And they lead, they lead examples for other people, and those other people follow. And then you have, you know, uh, demons in a really good practice who are only doing evil stuff and causing harm for other, everybody else. Yeah. Again, I find most um, most of the time I don't want to point out any other religions or anything. But you see a lot of people that talk the talk but don't walk the walk. Yeah, yeah. And there's another thing that you mentioned in this, you know. Another thing about Buddhists, I mean, people who are non-Buddhist and 
they always criticize others who are. Then you have other Buddhists who criticize fellow Buddhists into saying, oh, one is more Buddhist than the other. <laughs> There's no such thing. Um, and also when you have non-Buddhists criticizing other Buddhists, well, they go, well, Buddhists shouldn't be angry. Buddhists shouldn't do drugs. Buddhists shouldn't be drinking. Buddhists shouldn't be eating meat. Buddhists shouldn't be doing this or that. But they're not Buddhists. They don't understand the teachings. They never went to a Dharma, Dharma talk. They never read up an actual sutra. They never investigated a commentary. They never sat in meditation applying the principles of the teachings they were investigating. So they have no clue what they're talking about. Buddhists can get angry because they're human and they are still practicing. Ah, they will eat meat because maybe that's just their way of living. Uh, they will drink unless... Uh, Something happens. You know, if they're a drinker, then they drink. You know, if they're alcoholic, then they're alcoholic. If they do drugs, then they're a drug addict. That's just the way things are. Um, how they deal with it in their states, nobody knows unless they are with them all the time, unless they can reach their level or read their mind or really open their own mind to figure out what the hell is going on in a person's life. So, you know, walk the walk and talk the talk, and then you got people who criticize who have no clue what they're talking about. Remember, reading a book in Barnes and Nobles or buying one on Amazon about Buddhism or Taoism doesn't make you either of them. You have right. to practice it and apply yourself. You know, you can accept the teachings and really apply it. Then, you know, that's it. You're living that life, whatever that life is going to be for you. You know. So let's go on before. <laughs> and and I guess maybe we we should mention you've got uh, some hustle and bustle going on in the background at your uh, your office as yes. well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the school we have here, uh, this is in, in between classes, so we're gonna have a few a few ten fifteen minutes of uh, background noise. But um, hey, that's life. <laughs> the point right, of the let's... show is deal with what we got. Right, right. Okay, let's move on. Great. Commu uh, the next one: unity in communication. Do not say harmful things. Do not quarrel to bring about anger, which may lead to fighting. Now, in a in cultivation group, you know, in sangha, you, you may get antsy with each other. You know, that's all you see is the same people every day doing the same thing. And sometimes you feel a little better off than other people. You feel like oh, I'm better than that person. I can do. I can sweep the floor better. You know, or I can read a sutra out loud better, or whatever the case is. There's always going to be some type of argument or a comparison going on uh, if the person don't control themselves. So unity and communication is how you're going to handle your karma of the mouth. How are you going to handle your speech? <clears throat> and then instead of bringing this into a temple, first I'm always going to refer to that and then go to our societal living, um, non-religious societal living to that degree. So it's open for everyone to practice. It's really watching what you say. It doesn't matter if you have the truth. Okay? If even you saying the truth is going to cause disharmony, unless it's where someone's hurting another person or really hurting themselves or it's a life in that situation, you don't have to always open your mouth. Or there's always a better way to say something. So maybe it's uh, to one's spouse, you know. Uh, they see the person doing the same thing every day and they're like kind of annoyed by it. Maybe it's a throwing paper on the floor. Or maybe it's a throwing a sock on the floor or whatever the hell we can think of that we get, um, you know, complain about here and there, get frustrated about. And then you let it build up inside and you turn around and the way you say it, maybe – Saying it itself was not a problem, but it was the way it was handled caused the other person to feel defensive because they still have attachments to their, their own uh, views of themselves and what they do. So we got to be mindful. So if you're a cultivator or if you're hearing this and you're thinking, I like these ideas, remember, just because you practice them does not make it right for everyone else. But your, your example you lead will make others feel uh, curious about what you do. So if we mention, oh, why do you always throw this on the floor? Why do you always do that? Because you have some anger inside. Because you still have views of superiority. You still have views of that your ways are better or just a common sense idea. Just because it's a common sense idea doesn't mean that it should be labeled as superior to anyone else's uh, common sense ideas. Common sense in the U.S. is not common sense in the East. It is not common sense in one person's house to the other person's house. So the way we speak uh, can really affect other people. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It doesn't matter if you have the truth. It doesn't matter how you feel or what your views are. Know how to carry it across so the other person can really find a better way to handle it. So if the person is doing or saying, even saying ignorant things or whatever the case is that you feel affects you, just 
showing some type of kindness in how you speak doesn't mean you are inferior. And speaking loudly about it doesn't mean you're superior. Ah, uh, Originally, you have to be speaking directly to the heart of that person. That means you have to really feel inside what it is like to actually talk to the person itself without their views. What is that person's views about themselves? What do you think that person is like? How do you view them? Then throw it in the garbage and really see, imagine that it's their spirit, that is, it's some type of pure compassionate energy, that specific state of mind, that specific inherent wisdom you want to go right to. And you direct your intentions to that. And you can just turn around and say, you know, what you're saying really, you know, really makes me not feel too comfortable. Do you mind um, not saying it like that? I mean, if the person still wants to argue, you can still control yourself. Why would you want to argue with someone when you don't want them to argue with you? If they're arguing with you, it doesn't mean, well, they're doing it to me so I can do it to them. No, because then it's going to happen again and again. So one's demeanor is very important. One's speech and mannerisms is very important. We have to be very considerate. We want others to be considerate of us. We have to do it first and foremost. And when they're not considerate of us, then we can either step away or we can try to be an example to show them how it's like. But we don't force them into understanding it or force them to um, accepting uh, the mannerism in which we are coming across as. Not everyone will accept that. Sometimes heart compassion is more important. Sometimes when a person don't listen to your nice ways of speech, sometimes a big yell, we stop them and make them cry and really think about what the hell they did. And some may even turn it against you and say, oh, look, now you're angry. Well, yeah. And if they don't understand that kind of, the, those kind of a cause and effect, well, then, you know, it's kind of like trying to teach a baby how to drive a car. <laughs> it's well, not going to happen. I guess that's kind of like hitting them with the chan stick, though, isn't it? Pretty much. I mean, people don't like that because it's really a smack in the head, more like a slap in the face and uh, pulling their eyes wide open, letting them see exactly what the hell they did. I had experiences right. like this before. And in calm communication over long periods of time, I'm talking three, three year period of constant, constant, <laughs> nice way of explaining how things are. Um, the person still just didn't get it. So when you really blow it up in their face, not blow up angrily, but throw everything up in their face, they turn around and go, how is that possible? And they really have no clue. And they try any which way from Sunday to figure out how they're going to shut you out. And they can't because you're still not playing their game. You understand the game of uh, arguing and the game of superiority and inferiority is very complex. The best way to chop it off is to not entertain it whatsoever. And you do that by understanding how I'm going to, to speak to someone is how they're going to speak to me. And if they don't, I'm still going to maintain the way I do unless they're causing extreme serious problems. And then you'll have to take the right view or the right application of conduct in showing that person what they're doing is wrong. That's all. So it's always find the best route to explain things to people. That way there's no infighting. Hmm. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, next one, number three, unity in thought. Interesting. Interesting. Consider every person's idea and work out of common solution to satisfy all parties. Only can tasks be accomplished. <clears throat> Excuse me. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Consider everyone's idea, everyone's application of their hard work of their energy in what they're doing. Okay, consider that. Okay, and whenever there's uh, some type of side step or some type of uh, obstacle here and there, based on the common solution, based on the common views that we have, let's work on a solution to fix the problem, you know, for everyone. So let's say maybe you're at home. And the laundry needs to get done. <laughs> and uh, not you, but generally, one is home, laundry needs to get done, and they're on the couch watching the football game. And then, or soccer or football, American football or you know, whatever, don't matter. You're watching sports. <laughs> and maybe, uh, maybe it's the wife watching sports. Maybe it's the husband watching sports. It's the boyfriend and girlfriend. And then one of the other comes around and says, the laundry needs to get done. You're like, yeah, okay, go ahead, go do it. 
<laughs> you know, <clears throat> like, well, why don't you get off your butt and go do it too? You need to do it. I mean, I'm here doing other stuff. And in this, I'm doing this much. You should do that much. And the other person says, well, I did this. And then, well, that equals you having to do the next thing. So there's this constant infighting of how much I've done to, to be able to be able to sit down and put my feet up. And the other one argues the same point. When both understand that they both need to wear clothes. So the clothes need to be cleaned. So it wouldn't really matter what game is on TV or what is on TV or what other person's activities need to be, they will need clothes for the day after, even if they have tons of clothes to carry them up until the laundry is done. Why hold off until the laundry becomes a mountain, right? I'm just using it as an example. Uh, apply this to everything else. If you see a piece of paper on the floor, maybe someone threw it on the floor, pick it up and throw it out. What's the point of complaining, oh, this person litter, they're stupid. They shouldn't litter in the street. And then you walk right by it. You just did what the other person did. <laughs> That's the point. Uh, like for me, I see in the street sometimes the wind blows people's bikes over. I walk over and I adjust the bike. Yeah, the thought crossed my mind. Well, if the person sees me moving their bike and they think I'm trying to steal it, then they come screaming at me. Okay, then so be it. But if I had a bicycle and it fell on the floor, I would really be appreciative. Even if I didn't know the person had lifted it up. I would be appreciative that my bike is still standing. It's not on the floor, scratched up or almost broken or being stepped on or kicked to the side or something. Then someone would tell me, oh, the bike fell down. Someone turned it over for you. I'd be like, wow, you know, there's some that's, that's good hope in the world, you know, and, and just for the sake of saying the word hope. Uh, so what is this unity in thought? It's really considering everybody's idea, really considering how everybody is meaning contemplate living beings. Uh, even if you're not Buddhist, it don't matter. You go out and say, hey, people are doing these specific things while I'm passing through in the street. If I see a little problem, something small that I can handle, I'll go and do it. Why not? A person needs a, an, an extra 50 cents, I'll throw them 50 cents. You know, a person has a flat tire, I'll see if I have the capacity to help them out. If not, you know, maybe I can use my... Uh, triple-A card and you know, get a tow truck over here to help them out. Something like that. If you can't, you can't. But you have, this you have the application of considering other people. Now, its use in the temple was, you know, if you're passing by a heap of uh, leaves in the, in, in, on the walkway and the monk over there is sleeping with a broom over his belly, instead of uh, kicking him aside and saying, what the hell's wrong with you, and started arguing over him and, then you just pick up the broom yourself and sweep it up. You saw it. Now, that's your duty. I tell my students that all day long in class. If you see paper on the floor, pick it up. If you don't, you did exactly what the other person did. Yeah, it we have matter. I was going to say we have an expression in uh, the, the Taoist um, <laughs> kind of associated with it. It's uh, I see, hands do. I see, hands do. There you go. That's cool. Um, and, and one other thing uh, in relation to how you originally explained it, um, it brought to mind, say, in a business um, uh, setting that um, uh, it would be sort of a consensus de decision versus an executive decision. Oh. So so basically you would uh, get everyone's input and then sort of pick the best solution instead of just mm -hmm. making – overruling everybody with your own solution. There you go, because you're getting people's you know, ideas and concepts together, and then you're working on ways to empower them. You know? Yeah. What can be accomplished? A person cannot be better than other people. So it's not the person is an accomplished person because they do all the good deeds or they're at home and they take care of all the things. That's just a general responsibility that we all would have as an obligation to do what we are supposed to be doing according to the conditions we gave ourselves in being in a relationship with another person and living with them. But what we do can be accomplished. Now, if we can follow up with that, means follow through with what we are obligated to be doing because of our choices. Remember, obligation does not mean it goes out of your way to do something regardless of the situation. It's because you chose a specific outcome by the choices you made. Now you're obligated to do these things based on it, you know? Hmm. 
All right. Did you want to move cool. on to the next one? We shall move on. Unity in observing the precepts. Mm, now we're getting to the religious aspect or what people consider religious aspect. Here, remember, this was just specifically for Buddhists. So I'm going to read this aspect, but I'm going to change it up afterwards. Always encourage and help each other to practice Buddhism. So if you're in a Buddhist community, you empower what, you're, what basically everyone is cultivating. You know, you're part of it. So you do what is to be done as part of that whole group. Uh, you don't go to, I don't know, people go to bars. You don't go to a bar and order a glass of water unless you do. <laughs> you know? Or you don't go to a meat house and all of a sudden say, you got any salad? <laughs> you know? I'm kidding. Here, it's in for Buddhism. But generally, if you're a Muslim and you're in a, with a group of um, Muslims and you Cultivate the Islamic practices. You, call, you, you, you pray to Allah at the times you're supposed to pray. And you empower each other to do that. If one is probably sleeping and it's almost the noontime and you wake his butt up and you say, let's go. We got to pray. You know, if the sun is going down you, and they're, they're, they're falling asleep or maybe watching TV, you shut off the TV. Let's go. Come on. Let's get things going. We got to pray. You know, you got to really empower each other. So whatever, if you're religious, whatever religious um, um Activities you're supposed to be doing throughout the day to uh, cultivate, you know, uh, fulfilling whatever it is you're supposed to fulfill in your practice, you know, you got to gather those people around who are part of a group if you're with a group and you say, okay, now it's time to do this. Okay, now it's time to do that. Don't be lazy. Let's really cultivate. So apply this to everything. If you're home, same thing as a home, home-bodied person where they have a family and whatnot. Okay, what are the, the, the kind of standards you have for the household? Okay, this needs to be get done at this time. This needs to be done at another time. We can do this at another time. It doesn't have to be strictly 1 o'clock do this, 2 o'clock do that, whatever. But a general idea of what needs to be done to keep the house in order, clean, you know, tidy, uh, make everyone uh, um, somewhat comfortable, then those things should be done. And if someone doesn't want to do it, well, maybe they're just getting lazy, and you just talk to them saying this is what needs to be done and blah, blah, blah. And you go over the methods that, that are generally – general methods to help someone uh, feel like they have to have responsibility for what they're doing. So at home, it, it goes that way. So whatever it is that you do, whatever religion or even in society, even at home, family or not, there's a specific way you handle yourself and it's basically that. What are the terms or the specific standards of a certain place? You uphold that. If you don't like it, go home or get out. It's really simple. You know, like in my household, you walk in the door, you got to take your shoes off. Okay? And then it's just that way. Uh, some other people, they say, oh, when you open their door and you see a whole rack of shoes and obviously there's slippers on the floor and it's raining outside. You don't just walk right into the house like who cares or wipe your feet a little bit and walk around like your feet aren't going to be wet. Sorry. Take your shoes off. That's their standards in their house. You know, uh, same thing here. Um, there's certain ways to run things in a household, and you follow that. So this fourth one, observing the precepts, it can be precepts, it can be vows, it can be mannerisms of practice or mannerisms of living, okay? Empowering one's lifestyle or, like I said before, household rules or societal rules. Now, there's no real societal rules, but there's a basic understanding of what can and what can and cannot be done or what should and shouldn't be done in society randomly. Um, so basically, you don't want to just jump out and stand out around the crowd and be like, I'm the greatest this and that. No, it doesn't work that way. So, I, mean, I yeah. just kind of had a vision uh, <laughs> of a rowboat, right? And if everybody's all rowing in the same direction at the same time, you know, you're all going to get to the destination quicker. Right. There you go. I mean, if I'm crossing the street and there's an old lady, literally, that has to cross the street, and you can't really pick up the old lady to just carry her across, but you can guide her along the way. I mean, I've done that a few times here, and uh, some people, they're old, and they're walking, and still cars are driving like maniacs here. They have no concept of uh, rules in, uh, of driving in China. So um, I just stand on the side of the person. The direction of the cars, I stand in front of uh, the cars, basically, so they don't run over the people. Um, yeah, that's just what you do. You, you help observe the, the societal ways of keeping people uh, protected, you know, safe, 
and whatnot. That's unity and observing the precepts. For me, that would be giving someone the feeling of safety, to be fearless. Uh, so in society, giving someone that is a very good thing for them. You try to help them out and let them feel some type of uh, hope for the future, for themselves, for the sake of saying hope. Uh, cool. Let's move on. All right. Unity and sharing. Oh, what's that? I have an apple. I'll give you half. <laughs> Benefits gained by an individual or groups must be shared equally with others. This not only refers to money, but also any kind of recognition. So, so in uh, general, in the temple, it's, oh, this is a great temple. Yeah, there's a wonderful teacher there. Oh, we got to go see that teacher when there's about five other teachers there too. And you only go pick out one of, the, one of them. You know, you say, hey, this one is better than the other ones. And uh, you go and you build up that person. And that, that teacher turns around and goes, yeah, I'm great. Yeah, he totally has cut off any properness between his relationship with uh, the other monks there, the other teachers there. So sharing is someone gives you credit, you spread it around. No, 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 no. It's not me if the monk turns on. No, no, no. It's all of us. We're all cultivating. We're all, we're all really pretty good. You know, if it wasn't for this person, if it wasn't for that person, blah, 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 so on and so forth. You know? Now, in, in society, when someone gives you credit and you sit there and you, your chest busts out and you go, yeah, I'm awesome, you know? Uh, usually you can say, no, 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 no. It's okay. Uh, it's nothing really. You know, you be humble. In your heart, if you're not humble, if you're not really believing that it was nothing, people will know eventually. and They'll just give you the side eye like, oh, okay, great. Okay, good. Goodbye. You know, and then they'll, they'll kind of feel you out or they'll keep you around because they know they can get something from you because you need to have some type of, you know, standard of I'm great and I'm awesome and I can do this and I work the hardest or I do the most than anybody else or whatever the case is. These things kind of tell people, you're an e egotistical person, and I really don't want to be around you, but I know what I can get from you, so I'm going to use you. I'm going to make you think I like you, and then I'm going to use you. So you just create more problems for people. Sharing sounds like, is, you sounds like you're describing uh, Western corporate culture. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> when I had a school, when I had my school in, um, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, I used to tell my students, when we talk about the school, I would say, our you know, and then they looked at one of them looked at me with the side. I like, what do you mean? And I say, our school, it's yours. What do you like in here? What do you dislike in here? And I give the foundation of my tradition, what I've practiced since childhood and what I've developed over time here. I leave it here. What would you put in and what would you take out? And I had Muslims, Jews, um, Christians, Catholics, you know, whatever. I had a lot of different people and, and atheists as well. People just don't believe in any religion whatsoever. And they were like, no, it's fine. You know, I had a Muslim student that would go to my recitation machine. I had a little recitation machine that would um, recite uh, Namo Amitabha Buddha like 24-7. <laughs> he would go over to it and blast it. He goes, I don't know what it says, but it makes me feel wonderful. It makes me feel beautiful. So I said, would you like to know what it means? And he said, sure. I said, okay, I'll tell you. And I explained to him what the name Amitabha Buddha means, what the name Amitabha means, and what was the focus of the use of such a recitation. And he said, wonderful. I love it. We got to keep it playing. Every time we come in, make sure it's playing. Ah, and he's a devout Muslim. So what does that mean? It means that we can break all barriers of our, you know, this is better and this is not better if we simply just observe what we said in the other one, unity and thought. What's good for everyone else? How do you make other people feel better? How do you empower other people to feel better without empowering their ego, but empowering what nourishes them? Compassion. Ah. So now we go back to number five, sharing. Okay, whatever I get, I give. How do we do that? I got a lot of money. Someone will say, I got a lot of money. How do I give my money to other people? Then I'm left without money. No, no, no. It's nothing to do like that in that general aspect. I mean, take it as in your household. You have a family. Whatever you work for, whatever money you make, that's for the family. That's not your pocket money. Like for me, I make whatever money I make. It goes right to the bank. My card goes in my, my uh, bank card goes in the, in the drawer. And um, that's it. 
I barely look at my money. I asked my wife here and there, what's the deal? How much money we got left? And she goes, oh, we have this such and such. So, all right, good. Oh, I need some money to go and buy some things for the house. Or I want to go buy a pair of pants or this and that. Okay, no big deal. Why? Because the majority of everything that I'm doing is just for the house. I, I'd have no problem with that. That's exactly the point of having a family. It's your yeah. own little world. And you tend to, when you have a family, um, and in most cases, you would usually do without yourself to you know, mm-hmm. ensure that the others are provided for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And you take on more so everyone else can have. Right. You know, and that is sharing. So your own family is your own little small cultivation group. Maybe you're a Taoist cultivator and your wife isn't or your husband isn't, but you are. So you live the life as though you are preparing everything for these people. Ah, and whether they, you know, believe in what you believe in or not, it doesn't matter. The fact is you can give the best of what you practice to people. It may not be just money. Maybe it's just attitude. Ah, so sharing goes in very many different levels. And it doesn't have to just deal with Buddhism. Even don't, even mm-hmm. sharing your time, you know, there's mm-hmm. there's you know times you'd want to do something, but um, maybe my kids want to go to the playground or something. So you know, I put off what what I want to do, and you know, so that they'll be happy. Right, and we do that because uh, at home parents, they are at home Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They give and do everything for that world. The people who have affinities with them the strongest are their kids and their wife or their husband. That is the world you live in. That is your pure land. Whatever pure land you have, you live in, whatever Buddha land you want to make, your house is one. Whatever heaven you believe in, whatever God you believe in, just make your house like that. This is how I want my house to be. I'm going to prepare it that way. And they don't believe in the same religion or they don't believe in the same practices. I'm just going to lead by example. You know, you don't force them to believe anything. You just let them understand and see. Uh, that's also sharing sharing the principles of your practice or the principles of what you believe in, Ah, sharing it through example. And eventually, maybe they're interested. And if not, at least they have a good foundation of how to live in the world. They will not be crazy people. (laughs) You know? Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, exactly. Once they get to uh, school and start listening to music, forget it. (laughs) And TV. Oh, forget it, yeah, TV. (laughs) All right, let's move on to the next one. Last one, unity in views and explanation. Share your knowledge and understanding with others so everyone can improve together and reach the same level of understanding. Ah, now this doesn't mean I have a gun, I like to kill people, so I'm going to teach everyone else how good this is and let them understand my level of understanding so I can go out and uh, have more people going around killing other people. That's how demons work, actually. (laughs) You know, that's actually how demons work. Um, External. Okay, like uh, heavenly demons and, and, and ghosts and stuff like that. They like to get you to be part of them. And it takes some time to turn a person over. It doesn't happen in like a day. But eventually, like, a person gets so influenced by certain views that they start transforming their whole entire worldview uh, based on those things that they've been listening to or being influenced by. And then what happens is the whole lifestyle, their whole lifetime, they're living that way. But that's still not done yet. It's just nourishing the ground still. You know, give it another few lifetimes and boom, you got them. And then they're in your grip, you know, uh, for the demons, I mean. Yeah. But um, if you're a cultivator and either you hold strong to the precepts that you have based in your practices or religion or education or whatever, it's very difficult for, for external influences to mess with you. So here, unity and views and explanation. Okay, you share with other people, but here we're talking about in a Buddhist temple or in a Buddhist community, everyone is sharing the same views. You know, Buddhism this, Buddhism that. Oh, I like this idea. No, I like that idea. Oh, tell me about it. You know, and they go on and on, and they empower each other and influence each other in a way that helps to uh, pass on these teachings to each other and understand them a little better. But just change Buddhism to any other religion and do the same thing. Now, this doesn't mean that. You go around preaching to people in the street, random people, handing flyers to them saying, we're the best and we're the greatest or we're being persecuted or we're being you know, tortured and this is how – no, you don't do that. <laughs> it just simply means those who are similar in views, you get together with. You empower. Now, 
someone will be like, well, I'm a Christian and I'm home and my family isn't Christian. You know, I go to church on Sunday, but I can't get them to come to church for the life of me. You know, what do I do? Well, very simple. Don't push them to go to church. You just live a good way. What views do they have? And try to find a way to empower them to have better views. It doesn't mean they have to believe in God. It doesn't mean they have to believe in anything. It just means they have to really understand how to integrate principle, good principle, with everyday living and how they uh, influence other people with the proper views. Okay, Get, Pull the principles out of what you practice and influence people with it. But don't go around screaming off the top of your lungs that this is better or this is worse or whatever, whatever. That's not going to go good. So those who have similar views, basically in our household, since we're talking about being at home, in the home life and in society, likeness attracts like, opposites oppose, generally, relatively. Um, so when we are home, um, you don't push what you have, but you send your advice here and there. Now what happens, the person may feel, well, they will not feel, uh, a, mm, what's that word? It starts with the Oh, I think uh, when you push something on someone so much, you know, they won't feel like you're pushing, uh, pushing on them what you think. You have to find the right way of speaking. So it goes right back to the way you speak. Ah, right. And then yeah. uh, I was just going to say um, this sort of makes me think of someone who, say, uh, had developed a special, say, a kung fu technique or something. And, um, you know, some people... I guess it's sort of the antithesis antithesis of the uh, precept. Um, you know, some people wouldn't want to share that because they would, you know, consider that this skill made them feel special or something. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? But the proper way would be, you know, I'm going to share this skill with everybody so everybody improves, right? Right, exactly. I mean, how I teach um, basically – Generally, whether it's cultivation or martial arts, uh, philosophy or whatever, it's basically I see the person from where they are and find a technique that's good for them um, and help them develop strength in it, um, develop, develop understanding in it. You know, there's no set time frame for how people should, you know, grow. They do it on their own. So those people who like to feel special and be like, oh, I have the most strongest type of energetic cultivation out there or I have the best fighting technique out there and I only give it to the few, um, whatever, who are very special people, who have the talent for it. Well, you know, don't even bother practicing it. Yeah. Seriously. yeah there's, there's a lot of sects out there that are like that. Exactly. I mean, i put it this way. If someone has a group and they really want you in it, <laughs> be really weary about them, <laughs> you know? just be careful and when it comes to like oh, when we're talking about here uh, view and explanation it basically means what are your ideas and how is it coming across how is it going to come across if a person out there is showing you something that they say is the best thing in the world eh, you know it's definitely trying to boost up your ego it's not really going to do any good for you um Really look – if you're looking for teachers, look for quiet, nice, whatever. You'll find it in your heart. But you got to really have a standard. And when it comes to being at home, when it comes to dealing with uh, conflicts or whatnot, okay, it's really about how you're going to come across and explaining what you do and what you feel and your views without putting the other person's views down and without them feeling like you are more superior than them. It's always as though you don't even want to reach them on, on an equal level. You want to let the person overflow with words. Let them spew out like a, like a broken dam and all the water is flooding outward, pushing, gushing outward. And then it dries down, slows down. Now it's your time to speak. There's no reason to jump in and argue and argue because it just puts more fuel on the fire. It doesn't work. So if you have your own specific ideas of how things should be in your home, you express it by speaking uh, nicely, without insinuations, okay? And you want to develop a household or a friend community uh, where you all have similar views on life, basically. I mean, really, uh, mainly smokers uh, gravitate towards smokers, drinkers gravitate towards drinkers, some do both. You know, uh, when I was strictly vegetarian for a time, 
uh, people really didn't want to go hang out with me because <laughs> it was like so hard to go out to eat. And I said, it doesn't matter. I'll just buy a salad or something. No big deal. You know, or if I would just drink hot water, they would be making fun of me or even the waiters would be like, the hell, hot water? What are you going to use that for? And I'm like, wow, you're so strange. <laughs> they looked at me as strange. So it was conflicts that way, but it doesn't mean you have to stay away from these people. It just means learn how to deal with that. Learn how to utilize your lifestyle in a way where you are welcoming to everyone. Ah, then people may become curious about it. Maybe if what you do is good, they may like it too. You know, so these are the six uh, six harmonies, very beneficial for our everyday living. Not just focused on Buddhism, but focused basically for our everyday life, at home life, in society, how you relate with people, family, friends, and whatnot. Um, we can use this no matter what religion we are. Just because it was spoken of by the Buddha doesn't mean it's a Buddhist and only for Buddhists. Buddhism is not truly a religion. It's more of an education of understanding our mind. Okay, so are you going to give us the seventh harmony now, the secret one that gives you uh, all the power in the universe? $5,000 first, and I'll give you the secret. <laughs> You'd probably be a rich man if you, if you told oh. people that, believe me. That reminds me of, uh, I did a lecture back in 2008 at one of the Fanyin Temple. I remember, uh, Oolong, you were there. And when we were practicing Qigong up in the second floor, they had a rug there. We were all wearing socks. And I'm walking over to everyone, uh, fixing, fixing their posture, and I started shocking them. And they're like, oh, crap, what the hell is that? Oh, what the hell is that? And I realized that it was just static electricity. But, you know, I think I, I, I zapped Dan a few times, uh, one of our friends, and um, I think I did to you and a few other, other people. But I was like, how'd you do that? And it was like watching me scratch my foot on the floor or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, we can sell that, you know, electric kung fu for like $5,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, you want to call it a wrap? Uh, yeah, we're done with the six harmonies. So everyone, really, um, this is a really good practice for uh, how you can keep a quote-unquote harmonious lifestyle at home. It's really good for you. Good for the family. Keeps things sane and happy. And I use this all the time. You know, there's just a bumps and, 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 you know, ebbs and flows in what we apply. Same thing with me. Um, but it's something that's being applied. It's a good foundation, even though it's a rocky start or a rocky middle or a rocky ending towards the next step in how you're going to utilize it. Still try to utilize it. It's just so if there's nothing else in the world you can do to, let's say, save a marriage, use this. It may help. Unless you totally just don't want to bother you know, oh well, what can you do at that point? <laughs> Can't run the other person over. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kidding. So I have a weird sense of humor. So that's your six harmonies, everyone. I hope you find the good way to utilize it. All right. Well, thank, thanks for uh, sharing your time with us again, Len. And uh, I want to thank good. all the. <laughs> and uh, thanks to all the listeners for listening to uh, Expedient Means. And please be sure to join us next week when Lynn discusses politics and holding the right view. Oh. And instead of Ooh, closing with the uh, Dao De Jing, <laughs> instead uh -oh. of closing with the Dao De Jing, I'm going to go with another Big Trouble in Little China. And it says, oh, starts like this, well, you see him. Well, you see, I'm not saying that I've been everywhere and I've done everything, but I do know it's a pretty amazing planet we live on here. And a man would have to be some kind of a fool to think we're all alone in this universe. That's a wrap. No, that's awesome. Wonderful. That show is just Peace. bubbling with wisdom. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I read it all from a fortune cookie. <laughs> Let's leave yeah, that part yeah. on the show, too. <laughs> sure.